Okay, so welcome to this next video in uh, the playlist on inflammation and angiogenesis. In this video, what we're going to start talking about is the lectin complement pathway. Okay, so in the previous video, what we discussed is the uh, classical complement pathway. Now we're going to move on to another uh, pathway by which you can activate these complement proteins uh, to start killing microbes. Okay, now we saw in the previous video that the classical complement pathway is activated by having an antibody of either the immunoglobulin G type or the immunoglobulin M type. Uh, which is bound to an antigen on the surface of the microbe. And therefore, uh, the classical complement pathway was dependent upon the adaptive immune system having uh, produced antibodies against antigens on the surface of the microbe. The lectin complement pathway is truly going to be part of the innate immune system. It doesn't require any part of the adaptive immune system, and it's just going to recognize general molecular patterns on the surface of microbes. Okay, so let's have the introduction bit now. Let's um, give set the steam for what's going to happen. Okay, so let's say uh, we have some microbe here. Okay, and this is an invading microbe. So let's say it's within our bodily tissues, which we do not want. Okay, then what we're going to do is initiate the inflammatory response uh, to this microbe. Okay, now. Basically, in the inflammatory response, uh, you do uh, three main things, basically. W one is that you vasodilate the blood vessels which supply uh, the area uh, which um, is infected by this microbe. Okay, so you vasodilate the arterioles that lead to that area. Two, you increase the leakiness of the capillaries and the venules that supply this area so that uh, fluid can leave the bloodstream and go into the interstitial space and form an inflammatory exudate. And three, you recruit leukocytes or white blood cells to the uh, interstitial fluid. So you move them out of the bloodstream and again into the interstitial fluid. So the inflammatory response is really all about bringing troops out of the bloodstream and uh, into the interstitial fluid where the microbe is invading. Okay, so we are in this video going to discuss the lectin complement pathway. So we're interested in the movement of complement proteins from the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid. So let's firstly set the scene. So the complement proteins are produced by the liver. So liver cells produce complement proteins, okay? So this is my drawing of a liver here. Now I'll label it up just to make it a little bit more obvious. And the liver is going to be producing these complement proteins uh, which are going to be put into the bloodstream, okay? So usually the complement proteins circulate in an inactive form within the bloodstream. Okay, so here's our complement proteins within the bloodstream. And usually they can't get out of the bloodstream. So they are just within the bloodstream in inactive forms doing absolutely nothing, basically. Right, okay, there is another important, um, important protein complex that's going to be very important for the lectin complement pathway. And these proteins that make up this complex are also going to be produced by the liver. Okay, so uh, these proteins are involved in the mannose binding lectin. Um, um, sorry, the mannose binding lectin um, um, complex, the MBL complex, okay? So we'll draw, discuss those proteins in a moment, but the proteins that are going to be involved in this, comp in this entire pathway, they're all going to be within the bloodstream. Now, when the inflammatory response is initiated, what will happen is, if this is an endothelial cell here, and here's another endothelial cell here, then as part of the inflammatory response, what will happen is these endothelial cells will move apart. So initially what will happen is the endothelial cells will be activated by type 1 activation. Okay, And in type 1 activation, what will happen is that you'll get something known as endothelial contraction. 
Okay, and in order to explain what this is, let me just draw a bigger picture. Right, so if I have the edge of my endothelial cell here, okay, so this is the edge of endothelial cell 1, so let me label these endothelial cells up. Let's call this endothelial cell 1, and let's call this endothelial cell 2, okay? So here are these two edges here. So this is endothelial cell 2 here, and this is endothelial cell 1 here. Right, so between these two endothelial cells, you have protein complexes that are holding the two edges of the endothelial cells together. Okay, so you have two major co protein complexes that hold the two endothelial cells together. Okay, so I'll show these here. So, the one that's more towards the lumen, which is over here, this is known as t a tight junction. So this is a tight junction between the two endothelial cells. And what I hope to communicate through this picture is that some of the proteins are provided by endothelial cell 1 in red here, and the other proteins are provided by endothelial cell 2. So both of them provide proteins to make up this tight complex, tight junction. Okay? Right. It's the same for this complex down here, and the lower of these two complexes is what's known as an adherens junction. Okay, so this is an adherens junction. And again, you, we can see that there are uh, some proteins that will be on the surface of endothelial cell 1, and some proteins which will be on the surface of endothelial cell 2. Okay, so here are the ones in, on the surface of endothelial cell 1, outlined in purple there. And here are the ones that are on the surface of endothelial cell 2, in green here. Right, okay, so, in endothelial contraction, which is a process that occurs after type 1 activation of the endothelial cells, what will happen is that you will pull the uh, proteins involved in these protein complexes apart, basically. And the way this is achieved is that you have actin filaments attached to the cytoplasmic domains of these proteins. So, for instance, this purple protein here, its cytoplasmic domain will have an actin filament attached to it. Now, actin filaments are made up of a polymer of actin monomers. So, actin is a very small little globular protein. So, one, one of these circles represents an actin monomer. What you can do, however, is polymerize the actin monomers together to make an actin filament or an actin polymer. And it's these long strands of actin polymerized together that are attached to the uh, cytoplasmic domain of these proteins. Okay, so to each one of these, you'll have actin filaments attached. So, again, to the uh, proteins that are on endothelial cell 1 that are involved in the tight junction, their cytoplasmic domains will have actin filaments attached. Okay, and it's the same for uh, the proteins in endothelial cell 2. Their cytoplasmic domains will also have actin filaments attached. And these actin filaments will go on far longer than I'm drawing them. They'll go on and on and on and on. Right, so, when the endothelial cell undergoes type 1 activation, what will happen is that these actin filaments will start to contract, okay? So these actin filaments of endothelial cell 1 will pull this way, and the actin filaments of endothelial cell 2 will pull this way, okay? And this is known as endothelial contraction. Okay, and you can see what's going to happen if we uh, undertake this process of endothelial contraction. You're going to pull the proteins which make up the tight junctions and the adherens junctions apart. Um, so you're going to pull the tight junctions and the adherens junctions apart. Okay, now, this means that the adhesion between the two neighbouring endothelial cells is going to get much uh, less tight, basically. In addition, what has to be realised is that these protein complexes themselves were actually forming a physical occlusion to anything wanting to move between the cells, i.e., in this gap between the two endothelial cells, you had, in the resting endothelial cells, tight junctions and adherens junctions, and these
The proteins involved in these formed a physical block, basically, for anything trying to move in between them. Not only did it hold the two membranes very closely opposed, but they formed a physical block. After type 1 activation, which initiates endothelial contraction, the tight junctions and the adherens junctions are going to have been pulled apart and they're going to open up gaps between these endothelial cells. Okay, now type 1 activation of endothelial cells occurs within minutes of uh, activation of the inflammatory response. However, there is another type of activation of endothelial cells known as type 2 activation of endothelial cells, which takes a few hours to occur, but this produces a more permanent change. So what type 2 activation is going to do is it's actually going to permanently retract uh, the uh, edges of these endothelial cells. Okay, so if I draw another little picture here. So here's our endothelial cell again. Okay. And we're going to imagine that this endothelial cell has undergone type 2 activation, which, will, as I say, will happen a few hours after, um, after initiation of the inflammatory response. What will happen, basically, is that the edges of these endothelial cells will get retracted. So basically, what you have to appreciate is what is holding this edge up? Why does the why does the cell membrane not just collapse down, basically? Well, basically, there's a very dense cytoskeletal network of protein filaments within this terminal bit here. Now, one of these very um, dense cytoskeletal filaments is actin. Another really important one is tubulin filaments. Okay, so actin and tubulin are both little proteins which polymerize to make huge, great polymers, which are uh, big strands, okay? So basically you have a meshwork of actin and tubulin filaments in the edges of these endothelial cells and those um, actin and tubulin filaments are what are holding uh, the edge of this endothelial cell up basically. So if you were to dismantle those actin and tubulin filaments, then basically there would be nothing holding the cell membrane up so it would just collapse down. So that's what you're going to do Okay, in each of these endothelial cells, what you're going to do is dismantle the actin and tubulin cytoskeletal network in the edges here. Okay, and when that happens, the cell membrane will collapse down to here, basically, in both cases. And you can see that that's going to open up a much wider gap between the two endothelial cells. Okay, so type 1 activation followed by type 2 activation is both going to open up gaps between the endothelial cells. And this is going to happen in the capillaries and the venules supplying this infected area. Okay, and this will allow uh, fluid from within the blood and also proteins from within the blood to leave the blood and go into the interstitial space, okay? So proteins and fluid are going to move into the interstitial space, and this will form what's known as an inflammatory exudate, okay? And this is what leads to the swelling of an inflamed area, because you're bringing in a whole um, new fluid, basically. You're bringing in lots of fluid from the blood that you're now dumping in the interstitial fluid, and that will increase the volume of the interstitial fluid and cause uh, swelling of the affected area. Okay, and in this inflammatory exudate, you have a huge number of proteins from within the blood, and the complement proteins will be in there, as well as the uh, mannose binding leptin proteins, and also uh, some other proteins associated with mannose binding leptin, which we'll see uh, in the next video. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.